I believe diversity is just makes you better because it makes you richer in terms of the different point of views you have. So that can only make your culture much more uh, open-minded um, and much more inclusive. We're discussing the future of work with Chano Fernandez, the co-CEO of Workday. Chano, what do your customers want from you or expect from you as the co-CEO of Workday? Of course, representing the company, but what they're expecting is, is a business trusted partnership, right? And what does that mean? They're clearly expecting us, helping them out with uh, innovation. They're clearly expecting us with, uh, you know, good, great customer service and support. Uh, they're clearly expecting us to be really honest and, um, and truthful in terms of delivering what we commit to, um, obviously, and provide a great uh, service, um, as I said, and be open um, and proactive with them, but also be, you know, listening in terms of when they provide us feedback, where we should be investing and, you know, which are the areas where they really need help, right? And last but not least, Michael, as I mentioned, we, we are privileged to, to manage key assets for our customers, right? They're people and their money, so they're expecting thought leadership for us on those areas, and we're sharing with them some best practices because we just have the privilege to interact with uh, many customers in these areas, plus our own experts, right? So that's what they're, they're expecting. You're a software company, and so, of course, at the core, you're delivering software and processes and features and so on. However, what do your customers expect in terms of leadership and guidance around those best practices and around where, where the world is going and what they should be doing as a, as a business? Yeah, the world, Michael, is changing so much right now. We have so many broad topics uh, that we're trying to lay us in with, right? We've been and we still are in the middle of a, of a social crisis, a, a health crisis, I would say an economic crisis in some of the verticals, clearly, or the industries, clearly the economy is recovering. Um, um, they're expecting that we have a point of view as well as, of course, as a partner to them, you know, broader than just the technology itself, right? Where do we think things are going? How do we handle things around, um, you know, ESG, employee and social governance and, and responsibility, right? How are we thinking about talent and the workforce talent that is out there, right? And, and many of you have been hearing about this great resignation on so many other topics, right? How are we thinking about climate and climate change and what are we doing as a company? But how are we supporting those endeavors if we are? Right. What about diversity? What are you know? What are we doing? How are we seeing it? What are the things that we're putting in place and practices? Can or with technology help or not help? Right. What about um, the skills and how we are attracting and, and retaining talents these days and how we're handling those things? So it's a it's a number of different broad topics that I think they're just expecting. You know, good conversation as I said before. Share some point of views from from our own direct intel, but also from the opportunity that we have to you know, and engaging with many, with many customers across many different industries on, on some of these dimensions. Many of your customers are the largest organizations in the world. And so when you're talking with them, to what extent do they want to engage with you around these, the, the points of view on these various topics? Again, as distinct from, well, your software does this or your software does that. When we're having executive conversations, it's more the, the discussion, Michael, okay, if you're going to help me out, you know, to digitally transform my company and you're going to be an enabler on that process, what does exactly that mean, right? What should it be, you know, the do's and the don'ts, the learnings that you do have from other organizations? How do I get ready to make it successful? How do I measure it when it is there to make it successful? What should be the, the talents and the skills and resources that I should dedicate on my company to make that happen, right? And then... That will drive to, you know, broader topics, as I said before, in terms of critical topics around the world of HR and finance. Hopefully, these days, a lot around the world of HR, because there's been, a, a, you know, a lot on that area, clearly how all of us are, are managing and handling, you know, these changes and, and COVID as a whole and employee engagement and, and mental health, but, but, uh, but clearly as well from, you know, from the thought leadership, particularly on what are we reflecting as well on the inputs we have on the solutions we have and we're building right on the software you mentioned hr and when we talk about hr and 
where work is going, the impact of the last year on how people work, whether they're in offices, hybrid, and then it goes far deeper than that. Can you share with us your thinking on the future of work? I think it's a topic that affects pretty much everybody. First of all, clearly, we all lifted this year where some of us still today here from home are living it. The, the, the world today is, is much more virtual and much more remote, right? It's much more diverse than it used to be, and we're all aiming to aim, aim, make it much more diverse uh, too, uh, right? It's, it's much more not really employees looking for full-time engagements, is looking more for contingent or, or you know, hourly or freelancers engagements than, than it's been before. The people are looking for much more flexibility than they were looking before um, and looking at things differently. We're looking as well in terms of, you know, how do we attract talent is more skill-based and experience-based more than really what is your curriculum or academic, uh, you know, pedigree that you're bringing to the table, right? So if you think about clearly much more digital than it used to be a much more technology-based as a whole, of course, to enable, you know, some of these conversations and meetings and, and, and really rethinking, right, as well, even when we're just thinking, you know, what is the role of the offices and the role of when companies are going back to, what well, we say back to work, but back, back to the office, what is the meaning that we want to give and provide to those offices and the, those experiences and those moments that matters for our employees when they get together, right? And how is that different thought out and how we enable that from what it was before the pre-pandemic? So I think some of these, you know, trends and um, um, characteristics, Michael, that were there, they're just being accelerated, right? And usually during a period of crisis, not many times new trends appear, but some of the trends that were there, they tend to get accelerated at that where we're seeing right now in that future work. In a way, it's kind of mirroring digital transformation that the changes in the, the, the pandemic has accelerated uh, workforces that were present already, very much like digital transformation. Where do you see this going over the next, you know, three, six, nine months? What are your customers telling you about how they're responding to this this very confusing uh, pandemic environment that we're in right now, where there's just so much uncertainty? I would say in the short term is you look at that period between these three to six to nine months. And again, let's see what happens with these Delta variants uh, across the world, right? And how um, harmful or, or, or challenging it is or it isn't, right? As the vaccines are, are doing their work. The most thing is how do we transition back to the office, right? And, 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 and how do we think about that, right? And, and we, for example, in Workday, what we've done, Michael, is first of all, we kind of uh, thought about employees in different groups, the ones that will work permanently, permanently, you know, remote, the ones that will be always in the office, the ones that we call it kind of seldom sometimes in the office, and the one that we call them mostly many times in the office. But as I was saying before, rethinking offices for what we call moments that matter, which is more for networking, innovation, and collaboration, right? You're just going to be doing your own work or, or through Zoom. Honestly, there's not much of a point uh, to go there. So those are many of the conversations that are now taking back to the, uh, you know, with our customers is how do we make that happen? How did that transition should be taking place? And how do we succeed to that transition? That Let's not forget it. It also has a, an important impact on everyone's company's culture and what do they want to make out of that one, right? And, and that is more particular decisions, how companies are thinking, what is, you know, what are my cultural goals and, and what I want my company to be and to mirror. And based on that, how I want my relationship and, and my values being reflected on, on, you know, on the engagements I have with my employees. One of the issues that I've heard people raise repeatedly about hybrid work, and, and even more so working from home, is how do you bring new, new employees in? How do you get those new employees to feel like they're part of the organization? How do you impart the cultural values to these folks? And just in general, how do you bring a level of spontaneity to the office in this new environment? I think it's one of the hardest one, Michael. I mean, imagine you're a newer employee and imagine you are even more in earlier years in your career, even just coming out of college or a couple of years of experience. But even if you are a bit more, let's say, with more broader experience, right? 
you getting onto a new company where at the beginning we all do want to create our own, you know, best potential impression and, and show what we can bring in terms of value. And you got to do that fully remotely. Of course, you got to build that networking fully remotely, which makes it much harder. I anticipate, I don't know, I not live it myself, but I talk to people, of course, that have joined in terms of even just reading people um, and behaviors and, you know, and how they act, just even, you know, not having the opportunity to see them acting, everyone in the room, which is also, you know, those attitudes and behaviors are the ones as well that are, uh, you know, making the identity of a culture. And you don't have that opportunity to do that, right? You get onto a video conference like this one and you just talk, let's go on to talk to the, what we are here to discuss and then, let, then let's leave because we have the, the, we have the next one, right? So just to building up those trusted relationships and that networking and just to being able to get really, you know, um, living what it is that the culture and how people behave and had more informal, chill out or relaxed conversations around the corridors in an office, you don't have that opportunity. So if you're much earlier in your, you know, career experience, I think it's just much tougher. Also, I believe the opportunity for you to be coach. Uh, ask informally. Sometimes, you know, you, you get girl a lot, a lot. You can learn a lot. So around a coffee machine or just going with someone for, for grabbing a sandwich or lunch. Um, and, you know, having an opportunity to ask other questions that usually you're not going to be asking through Zoom. So that is harder, definitely, uh, for onboarding new employees remotely than it is uh, doing it at the office, right? When you talk, and I've been talking recently with some of our, you know, latest innovations that we're bringing onto the software, I always am asking our software engineers how it is in collaboration, right? Uh, doing it remotely, especially when you are innovating, bringing a new product. And in many cases, like the one I was just talking about, you know, it also involves some other partners, like doing it with, uh, with Microsoft or with Google and creating APIs, and, I mean, connections and integrations with those partners. So... And, and they tell you it is doable, but it's just harder because our ability to get us a thing in a meeting room and do a flip chart and, you know, put it all together there and, and get to people to hunt over the pain and bring a storm with one another. I mean, it is, and there is good software to do it remotely, but it's not the same, right? So that's why... We're strong believers that for collaboration, innovation, uh, networking, onboarding new employees, it's, it's just harder. It is doable. We're doing it. We're managing it. We learn a lot. I'm sure we're doing it much better than when we started, but it is it's fair to recognize, at least our point of view, that it is just more difficult. Um, um, and I feel a little bit uh, sorry uh, for, for the new employees that have to go through that, uh, uh, you know, through that process because it's, it must be hard. We have a very interesting question on exactly this topic from Sarah Klimako. And Sarah asks, how has Workday continued to foster company culture while employees have been working remotely? We've tried to do our best. Have we done the best we could? Honestly, I don't know. Everything we should have done. I don't know, Sarah, right? But, uh, but first of all, we've been trying to communicate, communicate, and communicate, right? What that means is obviously you try to show, you know, who you are, um, you know, as a company, who you are as a human being, as an individual, we've been trying to lead even more so with compassion and empathy that has been much more relevant during this, uh, you know, period. What that means, Sarah, is that we've been, uh, and I think we always have tried that at Workday and hopefully we've done successfully, but we have been tried more to understand you as a, as not just as a professional, but as a human being, what are you going through? And how can we help? And without going into the details of how being helping, we've been really putting a number of programs in place to try to help our employees around. Clearly, there was a health part, but obviously there was a mental health part as part of the health one. There was an economic part, and we've been trying to do our part on helping them, you know, from a health perspective and from an economic perspective, how we could uh, we could do and try to be very close, right? To give you one example, um, you know, on my case, I've been doing a number of uh, what you could say is skip level calls, which is especially during last year, talking not just to my direct reports, but people one or two levels under, just just to see how they were doing and how they were hanging around and, and, and you know, and catching up and 
And really, there was something that we were not doing at Workday that we could be doing to help them out. Um, you know, not with other purpose when calling them. Uh, and people have been very appreciative of, of, of that and of those calls. And clearly, it also gave us an opportunity to listen. And certainly, there are other channels to consider, like, like maybe, you know, this is what we should be doing or, um, um, you know, we're not yet doing, but, you know, we got this great feedback from a number of employees discussing, right? So I guess by, by different means, of course, mostly remote, but, uh, but you know, but sometimes a phone call is, is better for this than a video call in terms of how people will talk to you, even if you're doing just through a walk and, you know, and you get more informal and relaxed that if I'm looking to you, you know, they're actually on your eyes and you might be saying to me a bit different things, but that's what we've been trying to do. And, and, and you know, I'm, my expectation our expectation, I would say, but my personal Sarah would have been like, if I'm doing that, hopefully people will see me as a role model on some of these tasks. And I'm expecting my employees and my re direct reports will be doing other things on top of, or maybe different things, but hopefully that will replicate and people will follow. You're CEO of, co-CEO of the company. You're a busy guy. You have to worry about the financial markets and your customers and company growth and all of these things. And so this issue of culture, how important is it to you personally? And we, what do you see as your role in the shaping of culture and the outcomes that you want from having the right kind of culture? I would say for us, it is critical, right? It is um, our legacy or the legacy I, I, I got as part of being co-CEO because the company was founded on strong values and a great culture by Dave and Anil, uh, you know, back 16 years ago. And of course, as we grow, we, we have the legacy into how do we make that culture even better, at least sustain it, right? Uh, to be honest, because as we do grow, it just doesn't get easier. Um, and clearly, what is the culture, right? At the end of the day, it's our identity, is the way we are able to retain our great talent, is the way we are able to represent our brand, is the, is the you know, is the basically the, the behaviors and the attitudes collectively of we as employees and what we represent. So it's, it's a tremendous important and relevant as well for employee engagement, employee productivity. So um, obviously, companies that, that have a good culture and the right culture that also falls and has an impact onto your balance sheet and your PL and your, your financials. And, and clearly, we have a very simple saying, right? That we've not seen uh, you know, companies that we have happy customers by and happy employees. That's why we always say, no doubt, that employees are our value number one, right? We get happy employees, uh, the rest will be much easier. That, you know, connection with customers and customer satisfaction, that innovation and that willingness to, to do the best thing for your company because you truly feel a sense of belonging of part of that company, right? And you want it to see, to see it succeeding. I think these days we hear so much about the importance of employee experience, but it was your co-CEO and the founder of Workday, co-founder of Workday and Neil Bushry, who some years ago made the point to me, he was a guest on CXO Talk, saying that if in order to be successful with our customers, we first need to be successful with our employees. I'm paraphrasing, but it's, a, it's essentially what you just said as well, I think. I think it's something that I also learned uh, when I joined uh, Guarte. I, I felt it. I, I, I think during these years, I've been digesting even more the importance of it and, and really do our best to protect, as I said, and, and enhance the culture because it truly, truly creates an impact. And you just have to see, you know, how helpful our values and our culture have been for Workday to navigate difficult times like last year. Again, on everyone trying to do the right things for, um, you know, clearly us as management team for our employees, our employees for their peers. And then last but not least, uh, of course, of critical importance, all of us for our customers, right? And, and try to see how can we help to go through the, these times where we all know we need to help, but we're here to, to play the long game. Right now, the most important thing is, uh, you know, helping each other. Um, and bringing shoulders together to navigate through these times. And clearly our values 
have been helping us out to navigate through through these last uh, 12, 15 months. I think this culture topic is resonating because we have a number of questions that are stacking up now on LinkedIn and Twitter. So number one, this is from Elizabeth Shaw. And Elizabeth says, there has been recently this meme regarding purpose and the chief purpose officer and so so purpose in relation to culture any thoughts about this notion of the purpose driven enterprise that we hear so much about recently purpose is tremendously important right and if you see when when any company gets um, you know potentially a new ceo or co-ceo in place i'm not saying on my case because i'm, I'm coming clearly internally within the company, and you might see less so that because, of course, I've been part of creating as well our purpose before within Quarte. But the first things you aim to do is try to shape, uh, you know, the strategy, try to create a vision and try to create a purpose, right? And a purpose is, of course, that, uh, you know, uh, us aligning together towards, uh, you know, towards some, that uh, North Star that we all want to achieve, right? Um, you know, and, and at Quarte, we... You know, we want to create, you know, that brighter, brighter quarter for all, right? And the for all is is really important, right? In terms of appealing to that diversity, um, and, and basically everyone, not just uh, not just a few of us uh, out there, right? So I think is is the is the rally cry uh, for for getting employees together in terms of what is that north vision, what is that north star that we're all navigating towards to jointly with the with the vision, but uh, you know that is bringing us together. And then of course you. You know, you as an employee have a sense of inclusive, inclusiveness and belonging as well towards that purpose, or you don't. So I think it is very important that does it resonate with me? And is that something that drives me towards, you know, action and towards feeling, you know, attached in terms of, you know, doing the right things or creating impact, uh, you know, on, on, on progressing towards achieving this purpose, right? We have another question from Arsalan Khan, who is a regular listener, and he asks great questions. And thank you for that, for listening and for your questions, Arsalan. Arsalan says, the pandemic pushed people to rethink their culture and how they work. But now companies are pushing employees to come back to work, even though they have been productive working from home. How do you handle resistance to folks who don't want to come back to work in the office? What the pandemic made us uh, do at work is more thinking about our business model, you know, and what are the areas that we thought uh, that our business model is very resilient and are great, and what are the things that maybe we should consider to shift, uh, to shift, sorry, and, and adapt, right? So we thought that, you know, our values, um, and our culture, we're, we're right. Of course, you know, culture, you always need to be working on it. And as I said before, I share some of the things that we do to work on it, right? We, we are not aiming to push uh, employees to, to come back to the office, right? We, we expecting and we want them to come back when they feel safe uh, and they feel, uh, you know, happy to do so, right? Um, of course, we believe that uh, our culture and we are best or when we are able to connect, and it's a culture of connectedness, right? Uh, and as I said before, but we are providing, uh, a, you know, a kind of significant long-term period of around six months, you know, after summer or so for people to transition back to the office. And we're expecting, again, the, the, the future right now is uncertain from a health perspective and what is going to happen, right? So I'm talking with the information we do have today, that we will be, you know, in a position to do so uh, at that uh, at that time. Hopefully, that we can achieve that goal. But more than pushing employees, I think if you believe on the culture of connectedness, is hopefully, uh, you know, some employees will realize what they are missing by not, uh, you know, connecting with their, um, you know, their form, their peers. Of course, again, when they feel that it is safe to do that. And they feel comfortable in doing so because that is tremendously important and very respectful of how everyone and when everyone is feeling that way, right? But I think that if you are able to create those moments where, 
you know, I don't know, the, the Pizza Tuesday or the Taco Friday or, or, or just the, the Coffee Monday, whatever you want to call it, right? Not every day being what, but just to give you an idea where, you know, I went back to the office um, and I just had a good time and I didn't realize what I was missing because I got to have a chuckle with Michael and I got to discuss with Sarah um, and, you know, it was just fantastic, right? Um, I mean, you know, you realize what you are missing. I mean, I... I uh, Oh, my own experience, just one example. When was it? Like a month ago or so, I went back to my London office because I have to do, we have our a significant partner event, our altitude event, and I had to do recording there. And there were only three people in the office that were helping me out with the event, you know, um, and, and I had a, you know, IT and, and some of the, the real estate managers. Yeah, and I had a great time in terms of just discussing with uh, with these three people. Um, and, you know, I said, that, that was good right and it was around the bend but just you know not doing it through zoom but just having a discussion there and then going down and just grabbing a coffee again it's a simple thing but i realized like oh, i i missed this one and let me tell you when i came back home i i felt happier i uh, maybe i'm a person that i get energy from people i felt more energized so again this is not our aim to to push anyone we're providing a significant transition period we want people to feel comfortable and and of course, that they feel that it's safe for them to do that. And that's very important. We care a lot about our employees as human beings. And if they don't feel that way, they shouldn't do it. But I think it's more important, like, yeah, I fully respect that, you know, remote, uh, um, you know, it can be great and you can be really productive. I'm also a believer, to be honest, personal opinion, long term, 100% remote. I don't know what it would mean for, for mental health perspective for many for many people, because I believe you just... You know, we are social animals. We need to share some of our emotions and some, uh, you know, have some social connections at some point. Um, and I think that just helps to for everyone to to be happier, to get some sort of different energy. We have a very interesting question from LinkedIn, and this is from Tim Mikhailovsky. And Tim says that he uh, has interviewed organiz organizational change specialists and researchers as part of his podcast. And he asks, how do you quantify company culture related behaviors and track them over time? And how do you integrate culture and behavior along with performance into your KPIs and your metrics? First of all, how do we measure or how do we how do how do we see the health of our culture, right? And maybe the best way to illustrate it is with uh, with an example, right, Tim? I I mean, um, back in 2016, um, we we are a fast growing company, so we were just you know uh, hiring a significant number of employees per year, and we realized, and then I'll tell you how we did so, that our culture was was basically deteriorating, right? Um, and we look at some of the data. Um, and we saw that uh, more than 50% of our managers were either uh, new managers in Quarte, people that we've been promoted, or they were maybe experienced people from the outside, but new managers within Quarte, right? Um, and we were growing so much that, again, you know, keeping great culture when you have a, a, a lot of growth is, is not easy, right? You always have to keep a continuous eye on it, right? So how do we realize that our culture was deteriorating is question number one, right? Um, and I said, uh, simple things, right? We, we saw that people were not saying good morning or smiling uh, when you were at the leaf, or it was less than we were just to see. We saw that someone was in the parking lot um, and was dropping a paper and maybe was not just picking up that paper, right? Um, and I love the definition of culture, that culture is, you know, how people behave when no one is watching, right? Or no one is looking, right? I love that one, right? So what did we do about it, right? Uh, we decided to do, a, um, you know, a people leadership summit with all of our new managers between 600 and 800 at that point in time, 2016, 17 was around 800 new managers per year where we got them together for two days in person, and we were just talking about culture and values in action. And honestly, that may seem, and I thought that maybe it was going to be a little bit fluffy, but it was so well done by the people on Purpose team, our HR organization, in terms of the examples, and, and really all of us as a management team participating, that, uh, that you know, the feedback even from very senior managers was very good. 
that we we understood, uh, you know, and we hope that all of them understood what it meant to lead within Guarte and with Guarte's culture, right? And with that, we feel that people will be doing the right things and taking the right decisions for our customers, for our employees, for the company as a whole, um, and definitely has an impact in, you know, in terms of, um, you know, how we are performing. I will hear many times that, uh, again, you know, more anecdotal, but very important that, that especially at a certain point in your career, people join companies because of culture, a very part reason why you attract talent. So I would say that work they attract talent maybe because you appeal to innovation and, um, and good culture, right? So, of course, you know, some of these metrics, and, and you know, and yes, we, we measure them, but some of these metrics and hopefully some of these examples thing hopefully, you know, gives you an idea how we think about it. We have another question from Twitter, a really interesting one. And this shifts the topic a little bit from culture to diversity and inclusion, which is so related to culture. And this is from, again, Sarah, Sarah Klimako, and she asks, what diversity and belonging efforts are you most proud of at Workday? I would say I'm proud of our journey, but we certainly cannot be complacent and we need to do much more, right? So obviously without going into much detail, we've done, many companies have done, but we've done significant investments, uh, especially in these last uh, last years and, and even ahead of the, the unfortunate incidents last year, last year, uh, you know, with George Floyd and, and some others on, on the Asian side, but clearly even, even before that, right? But last year we decided to, um, you know, to take even um, an, an increase, uh, basically action-oriented stance, um, and we allocated twenty of our brightest uh, employees across many different groups to work together um, across our different line of businesses around belonging and, and diversity, and basically help us out in terms of what else should we be doing that we are not doing. Right. Um, and as I said, there are a number of, of uh, actions in place. We set as, as, well, as well some goals for ourselves, just to share them here with you. I mean, there are more, but some of the critical ones are we aim to increase 30% of our Black and Latinx population by uh, 2023, and we aim to double the Black and Latinx managers by 2023. Among others, there are some uh, Asian or underrepresented minorities as a whole as well as part there of our goals. Um, and we have a, a number of initiatives in place. We put some of those as well on our software, right? With products like uh, our Vive Index and Vive Central. Vive starts for value, and inclusion, belonging, and equity, right? And again, you know, I'll go, go much in much detail what those products mean. And we're doing a very intentional, and I think intentional is the right word here, effort on trying to avoid any bias on our product, especially those that are more recruiting wise we've done as well a significant number of training with our managers in terms of how do we recruit and how we avoid the bias and, and doing and taking some actions on how you have more blind cds and and of course those based on the skills too so we're doing what we can we last but not least um we with um you know we change our um real estate uh, basically um strategies and we open in places like Atlanta, for example, in the U.S. and some others with the aim that they, that would help us to attract talent that would be more diverse, right? Because we believe that talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. How do you think about the measurement of these diversity and inclusion efforts? You mentioned a little bit earlier. You know, we put ourselves toward these goals. I mentioned a couple of things. So we have a number of them that can, can you know, that I mentioned about the Black and Latinx and the represented minority. We have as well our Byte Central, which is a dashboard on all the measures that we, we look into. And clearly, back in this also kind of mirrors the number of promotions, uh, you know, um, that, that are going to the different URN uh, and minorities and so on and so forth. We, we measure as well, for example, we work on a program, program with Year Up. That is an, an organization where we help uh, some people that are coming from more underserved backgrounds. And the privileged ones where we help them out to, you know, and invest on training them on, on some um, IT skills during six months or, or a year. Also veterans and also maybe females that may have, unfortunately, for family reasons, been away, uh, away from, from work for 15, 20 years period, maybe to help out to raise family. 
Um, and we try to give them opportunities coming back to work. They're investing on training. So we measure, of course, how much progress are we making in each of these progress in, in each of these programs, sorry, and how much people are we are we hiring and recruiting or are we promoting that are coming more from diverse uh, backgrounds. So yeah. What is the relationship between diversity inclu- and inclusion and the culture of the company? How do those fit together? I think they go all hand in hand, Michael, because I believe, you know, very simple thinking. I believe diversity is just makes you better because it, made you, it makes you richer in terms of the point, different point of views you have, right? So that can only make your culture much more uh, open-minded um, and much more inclusive in terms of, you know, uh, everyone that fits here with the... Uh, you know, very respectful of their opinions, their backgrounds, the different point of views, and just, uh, you know, enriching how, um, you know, a, a minority may think in terms of how a very diverse population will think and will see things, right? And of course, we're expecting that will go A, in our innovation, B, on our engagement and, and relationship with our customers and on the service that we provide. Let's take a quick question from, again, Arsalan Khan who ask and I'll, and Chano, I'll ask you to respond to this relatively quickly. Uh, Arsalan says a company's culture begins with hiring and job descriptions. How should job descriptions change considering this evolution in how people are working and the future of work? So the impact on job descriptions and talent hiring. I think it's going to be more a skills description, as I said before, than job description. We are already on that journey. We provide as well solutions that help customers there. And what matters the most is exactly where are the skills required for that, uh, you know, that particular role and you'll be successful on that one. So it's, it's a bit of a change from what it's been traditionally. What is the mark or the imprint that you personally would like to leave on Workday as the co-CEO? I would just like to, you know, but be seeing as he, he was someone that was a good role model, right? When I know here uh, in terms of our ambassador of our culture, uh, he definitely helped out with the team uh, on our journey to the 10 billion, which is our, our next, uh, you know, big milestone, right? We're around half of that uh, right now. Um, and, and he just, uh, you know, um, uh, clearly left great talent behind that's where as well really fitting well within the company. So I think if you leave great talent behind that fit well within the company, you leave the company pretty good hands basically just to continue the journey and you know, great people to contribute in, in many different ways. We have one more question that's popped up from Twitter. So why don't we take one more? And this is from Constance Woodson, who says, how can diversity and belonging become a thread within culture company culture and not a forecast for the future? I believe this is a journey where we need to commit, you know, long term. Uh, it's kind of be just a hype right now. It's going to be a, a bottoms up investment. And when I say bottoms up, at the end of the day, I believe you are going to have to focus on activities that will just fill the pipeline of diversity as a whole from you know the bottom meaning that you know earlier uh, tenure people on their careers making sure that you do have programs in place and you nurture those and invest on those that will allow those that talent as i said before talent is everywhere but opportunity is not to join companies and to join the workforce of, of the future right so it's like um you know um what I would like to see is that all of us are just doubling down and increasing, keep our efforts steady uh, and increase during not just the next one or two years, but whatever happens during the next 15, 20, 30 years. And hopefully, if we do so, that will not become a topic of discussion anymore because things will be balanced. Um, you know, most of those companies will be already diverse by itself and by definition. You always would need to look at things that you need to do to balance out uh, some pockets, but it's not like it is so unbalanced that it is the headline of every single day. Okay. And with that, I would like to thank Chano Fernandez. He is the co-CEO of Workday. Chano, thank you very much for taking time to be with us today. 
Thank you, Michael, for inviting me. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining and for your questions as well. Thank you so much. Have a great day and a great weekend. Everybody, thank you for watching and especially those people who ask such great questions. Before you go, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the subscribe button at the top of our website so we can send you our excellent newsletter and you should tell your friends and check out cxotalk.com. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Chano Fernandez, and have a great day. We'll see you soon.